right, we are back in the book of Revelation again, uh, chapter 17, so if you can turn there, that would be fantastic. Let me just, uh, it's been a few weeks, so let me just kind of bring you, uh, or bring back to memory where we sit. Uh, as we've talked about in the book of Revelation, my, uh, my understanding of this book is that we are dealing with um, a, uh, as the first three verses say, a book that is uh, an apocalyptic book. It's, it's giving, uh, giving us visions of things that are, going, that are taking place and going to take place that have an effect on the church. Uh, the book is an epistle. It's a prophecy, which means that it's written specifically to seven churches, and we are to listen in on the conversation the way we would with Ephesians or Galatians or Romans, and glean from that what applies to us. And so we have gone through the bulk of this book in understanding that we've got seals and trumpets and bowls, and that we've got what we've called this recapitulation, this revisiting of things from different angles. And so we have the first judgments that fall that are a quarter, and then we have a third, and then we have fullness, uh, which shows the fact that, that what God is doing in this world is going to intensify. So it, we're not just revisiting events, we're not just revisiting what God is doing, but there is, there is going to be a point in the future where God is going to intensify things so much that it will bring things to an end. And so what we're dealing with in Revelation is stuff that is applicable to us at all points at all times. So we're not looking for the identity of characters. We're not looking for the identity of, of particular places or numbers. We understand this to be a, a symbolic reflection on the Old Testament. And so we've gone back to the Old Testament to interpret the symbols. We've gone to the contemporary context of Revelation to understand them even better. And then we've tried to, to sort of pull out from that some of the lessons that we can learn from the book of Revelation. So we are in chapter 17 today. And with chapter 17, we, we enter into sort of, if I want to say it this way without us getting too Im, sort of immersed in it, we're, we're into sort of the end times of the book of Revelation. Here's what I mean by that. Is that in chapter 17, 18, and 19, we are going to be witness to the judgment and destruction of the primary agents of Satan in his opposition to God. And so we're going to see in chapter 17 and 18 the destruction of, well, really the introduction to and then the destruction of the great prostitute Babylon. And the beast and the false prophet are all going to be involved in this one final end, which is going to take place at the last half of chapter 19, and then when we get into uh, Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10, we're going to get to the destruction of Satan in an ultimate way. And so if we want to say it this way, we could, we could see it like this, that this last section of Revelation is a, a review or, or a, a more detailed understanding of the sixth and seventh bowls that we just read about in the earlier chapter six, in chapter 16. So here's what we've got, we've realized, is that with the opening of the seals, with the tr sounding of the trumpets, with the pouring of the bowls, at each point we've come to an end times ending of things. Not in detail, but we've come to a situation where with every seventh one, it ends, right? The vision of heaven comes in, the judgment comes in, et cetera, et cetera. And now what we have in verses eight, or chapter 18, 19, and 20 is a more detailed understanding of that judgment. Don't think chronology. Don't think, okay, well, I'm going to wait for these signs because that's not the intention here. But what, what essentially God is revealing to us is the ultimate end of all of these counterfeits. All of these things in this world, all of these characters that play a role in trying to pull us away from God, now we're getting a detailed view of their end, how it will end, why it will end the way it will end, to try and once again encourage us and challenge us in standing against these characters so that we can not only know how they operate, but see clearly their end. And then we're supposed to figure out, which I, I think we all will from these verses, that if we side 
with the prostitute, if we side with the dragon, if we side with the beast, this will also be our end. And so again, stand firm, overcome. So let's read chapter 17 together. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw, where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we... Uh, get into this new image of Revelation, we, we once again recognize the strangeness of what we just read and the difficulty that is right here in these pages of bridging the gap. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, help me to be able to explain what is going on here, that you would help us as a church to see what it is you want to communicate to us. And Lord, bring us the faithfulness that we need in order to go out into the lives of other people, into the world, uh, in faithful obedience for the furtherance of your kingdom and to the praise of your glory. Amen. As I mentioned before, what we're seeing here in chapter 17 is, the, is this final judgment that we're going to be witness to of these Trinitarian counterfeits. The beast, the false prophet, and now this great prostitute. And they're thematically parallel to what we've already seen in less detail throughout the book of Revelation. So we've already had multiple judgments happening, and they've just been sort of generalized. Peals of thunder, flashes of lightning, etc., etc., and it's over. And now we're going to find out the, the demise and the judgment that will fall on each one of those counterfeits as God brings judgment upon them. And they explain in considerable detail what this judgment is going to entail and how it will be brought about. And it appears with the great prostitute in 17 and 18 that this judgment is set within the context of the cry of the martyrs in chapter 6. You remember when we were privy to the martyrs when the fifth seal was opened 
they, they were under the altar and they, and they were crying out to the, to the Lord. They were crying out to Christ. How long, how long until you come and judge the earth? How long until you come and avenge the blood that we have shed on your behalf? And now we realize that in verse 6 of chapter 17, this is the one who shed the martyr's blood. And she is going to be judged And now the time, now the answer comes. Christ says, now's the time. And so what we end up having here is is God bringing his judgment upon the persecutors of his people. And as we see the judgment of God fall upon Satan and his minions, it's important that we're reminded about how Revelation has portrayed Satan's attack on the church. Because we've seen two strategies already of how the devil is trying to get at God's people. And now with the great prostitute, we're going to see a third. So the first strategy we saw when we were introduced to the beast. The beast attacks the church with, uh, if I can say it this way, with power, with strength, with a full frontal assault, using persecution as his main weapon to try and get the church to to give up their faith, to apostatize, and to split, and conquer, and divide. And so he endeavors to to destroy the witness of the saints by forcing them to decide between their life or an obedience to God, between the life of a loved one and obedience to God, between between ease and, and wealth and prosperity or death. And so the beast comes at the church in, in a full frontal way. But then we were introduced to the false prophet, the second member of this counterfeit trinity. And we were told that the false prophet approaches things a little bit differently. The false prophet tries to get people to worship the beast. There's a, a spiritual dimension to the ministry of the, of the false prophet. There's, there's a, a, a almost, we, we compared it to the Holy Spirit in the sense that that the false prophet tries to subtly get into the church through false teachings, through false philosophies, through false worldviews to try and get the people that the beast hasn't yet defeated to go a different way slowly, subtly, right? So if the beast can't defeat you with a full-on persecution, he'll divide and conquer by, by bringing in false teaching in the church and get you to turn away from the truth and eventually find yourself in service of the devil. And so basically what we could say is that the beast is a symbol of the, the, the state, if, if we want to say it that way. Now don't think government, but just think of, of anything that oppresses God's people within the structures of the sort of society that we live in, you know, economic, political, social, whatever. And the false prophet is the if we want to say it, the world view of said society. The, the world view that, that, that says God doesn't exist. It, that's just a defeater belief. You say, I'm a Christian. Well, God doesn't exist. You don't even have to demonstrate it. They say science proves everything and disproves God. That, that world view is an example of the false prophets. And in John's day, Rome was kind of all one of those things together. And so again, we need to understand the same way for us. That it doesn't matter who is sitting in parliament. It doesn't matter who the party is. There's something about the, the secular structures of our society that, that are oppressive to God's people, either aggressively or subtly. And in some places in the world, as we've seen in the news over Easter, it's very aggressive. Our Christian brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka have understood what that means to go to church on Easter Sunday and only to find their churches blown up, right? For us, we don't face that, praise the Lord, but we might face the false prophet, which I think is probably worse at times. And so there's nothing good about secular societal structures. They're always trying to get us to give up our first love. But the beast and the false prophet have a third ally, the great prostitute who is described here as riding upon the beast to show the intimacy of their attack. She rides upon him, and this great prostitute is a different attack on the church. Her attack is one of seduction. 
Again, we all know what prostitutes are about. We all know what they try and get you to do. We all know that the basis of their livelihood is to get you to go against your commitment, to get you to commit adultery against something or someone. And this prostitute, this is a perfect image of what we know prostitutes are about in, uh, in our society. They use seduction. They use ease of satisfaction. They try and convince you by using glamour and wealth and opulence and luxury and ease of living to turn against your God. And so they use the seductiveness of the wares of society to get God's people to just inch away from him a little bit, to just doubt his provision, to just doubt his providential protection, and to try and get us to commit a little bit more and more each day to the wealth, fame, sex, power of our society. And again, in, in this chapter, we'll see a number of times where Babylon is described in the context of Rome. So we need to understand that already. She's described in verse 9 as, first of all, she's sitting on a beast, and here she's straddling seven mountains. And I think the reference there is to Rome. Rome was originally settled on seven mountains. Not mountains the way we would understand them, but hills. And then Rome eventually began to grow in and around the valleys and then together as well. And as a result of that, what, what John is saying to his people is, listen, this prostitute which we are calling Babylon is seen in Rome. Now again, let's remember that Rome was an empire an empire that stretched from the borders of now Scotland all the way into the east as far as civilization went. It was a massive and intricate uh, empire full of economic and social benefit. And one of the things involved in the Roman government was this empire worship, this emperor worship. You could have your own god, you could be committed to your own philosophy, but you had to also worship the emperor. And so in Rome, we see the beast, the false prophet, and the prostitute typified beautifully. Because one of the great benefits of Rome was the pleasures, the sensuality, the prosperity that came with being a part of her empire. Everybody in the empire benefited from her wealth. And everybody outside of the empire wanted to come and trade and be a part of the empire because you could get rich quick. And so what we have is this attraction of this immediate society for our first century believers. This desire that's within all of us for well-being and comfort that Rome plays on. But again, our author is saying, if you want to join what the Romans are saying and what they're doing, you will have to give up your commitment to God. Political allegiance, worship of the Roman Empire and enjoyment of all the opulence that Rome has to offer comes with a price. You cannot serve two masters. You can either be a Roman and committed to what they're doing, or you can be a Christian and be committed to what they are doing. And so again, uh, the reason why I speak this way about Babylon and Rome is because we need to remember the symbolic nature of the prostitute and of Babylon. See, one of the dangers that we get into especially in these chapters, is that uh, some interpreters want, to, want us to see a reinvented Rome or a reestablished Babylon as an actual political and economic structure. But that's not the point. The point is that we understand that this prostitute, this great city of Babylon, takes all sorts of different forms. Babylon can't be confined excuse me, to any one historical manifestation. It has multiple equivalents. Notice verse 5. It's right there within the, within the text. <clears throat> On her forehead is written a name of mystery. <clears throat> she must have a big forehead. Because even in Greek, this is a long sentence. Her name is Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes. Let's stop there. Not just prostitutes as in men and women who sell their bodies to the night, but
but prostitutes in the context of what we will have revealed about her. So anybody who is going to do what she does is considered to be a prostitute as she is, and therefore they find their, their mother to be her. And I'll explain what that means in a few minutes. So she's the, the great mother of prostitutes and of all of earth's abominations. And so she is the source of all of this kind of stuff. And so anything and anybody that is going to fit within the categories that we're going to see about this prostitute is Babylon, is Rome, and that can be all sorts of different societies. And based upon her description, there's really no city, no no empire, whether it be Babylon or Sodom or Egypt or Rome or whatever it is that fits this. And so I think we can say it this way. Babylon is found, the great prostitute is found wherever there is the deception associated with her work. Wherever we find these things that will be described of her at work, that's where we find Babylon. That's where we find the great prostitute. And as I said before, she is the great sum of pagan culture in all of its pleasure-seeking. I think that if we can describe the, the ministry of the prostitute, that would be it. She is desiring for us to embrace heathenism, to embrace in a, a, a wealth mentality, to embrace apostasy because we're looking for something easy. We're looking for an image. We're looking for, for life that is going to satisfy in this life. And so now again, now we have a full picture of the way the devil tries to attack the church. Full on persecution. Coming at you full bear, you can identify your enemy. But then on the one side, he comes at the church with false teaching. By trying to divide the church with false philosophy and false teaching. But then on the other side, he's trying to convince the church that your blessings and inheritance in the next life are not worth it. That what you want is wealth satisfaction in this life. And so be willing to give up the next life for this life. That's essentially what all three are saying. Right? Why wait for the next life when you can have everything you've ever wanted in this life? And what John is describing here is saying this. If you give up this life, you will gain the next life. But if you give up the next life, you will only gain this life and your end will follow that whom your master is. So let me, let me just think about this in terms of our own time and place. It seems that our modern culture, I mean, this is, I think, probably the most obvious thing. You've probably already thought about it. Our modern culture with its wealth, false religions, sexual exploitation is... I think clearly a modern form of Babylon. The media, as one example, with which we are bombarded constantly, seduces us with a message that encourages our love of money, our desire for sex, power, and pleasure. I mean, listen, I was trying to watch the highlights of the Raptors game last night, and even that, I had to endure a 15-second commercial for a car. And then I wanted to watch the highlights of the Columbus-Boston game. And now i got to watch another 15-second commercial for another brand of car. See, we're being bombarded all the time with a message that says the car you have is not good enough. You need this one. We're bombarded with images and voices that call for us to be dissatisfied with our current situation and to reach for another product, more money, a better look, etc., etc. And we're constantly told... That satisfaction and meaningful living can only be found in something that we do not yet possess or have not yet experienced. Think about it. When was the last time you've been on your phone? Looked at Facebook? Looked at Pinterest? Looked at Instagram? Looked at Amazon? And come away feeling completely and utterly satisfied with your life? I need that next product. I need to learn how to do my hair like that. I need that new wedge because then I can get it 30 yards closer to the pin instead of 35. You know, there's always that next thing. And it's everywhere. It's all over the place. And if you're like me, you're too cheap to buy the app 
So you take the free one with the ads, and that makes it even worse. See, we're told that you should not be content in your life, and that if you just get that one more thing, you'll be satisfied. But we all know that once you get it, there's something else there, right? It's kind of like buying a laptop or a computer. You buy the laptop, and the one underneath that they put on is immediately better than the one that you just bought. And they just cycle through like that, right? As soon as you buy the Samsung Galaxy 10, they'll have a Samsung Galaxy 10X or 11 or whatever. It's the way our society works. Creating dissatisfaction. Now, why is it so effective? Because there is, I'm going to say this sort of weird, but there's, there's a Babylon in us that the Babylon outside us can access very easily. Here's what I mean by that. Is that there's sinfulness within us that is more than ready to satisfy the desires that we have in ways that are contrary to God. So, for example, sex is a gift of God, right? It's a blessing from God given to married couples in the garden, right? Adam, Eve, naked, what does God say? The thing that Adam was waiting to hear, be fruitful and multiply, all right? I can just imagine Eve going, oh, come on. Adam's like, yeah, right? And so from the very beginning, sex is given by God to, to a husband and a wife to be beautiful, to bring them together. And what has our culture done with it? It's made it gross and immoral. It's made it easy. It's made it, it's made it possible to have without relationship, without covenant. And, but there's, so there's, there's this beautiful God-given desire within us that the, 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 the culture around us, Babylon around us says, yeah, don't, don't fulfill it the way God wants you to. Fulfill it the way you want to. It's like the serpent in the very beginning. Did God really say? God's holding out on you, right? There's all this pleasure waiting for you and, and you're just going to restrict it to this? See, that's what this prostitute does. She, she comes at us with desires for sex and wealth and fame and power, health and beauty. They can all become idols for us, objects of our lust that drive us. And what we need to see in this chapter is that it's all foolishness. It all comes to nothing. And there's only one true and proper object of desire, and that is God himself. But let's understand that it's not just our society that presses this message. Unfortunately, that message of the prostitute can be seen inside the greater church. And I'll spare you details, but I think you'll all understand what I'm saying, is that, is that seduction comes not only from a world that promotes materialism, but from certain theological perspectives that promote materialism. We all know of theological liberalism that makes its peace with the philosophy of the world. We all know of health and wealth theology that says, listen, write down the money that you make right now. And a year from now, if you're faithful from God to God, God will bless it. And then write down that number and thank the Lord for what he's blessed you with. That's health and wealth. That's the prostitute getting together with the false prophet to try and convince you that what God wants in your life is for you to get more wealthy. And you've got shallow preaching from pulpits that offers self-help psychology, pop psychology, rather than the message of sin and redemption as the remedy to our problems. And so even within the church, we can be convinced that what God's goal for us is, is to make us healthy, wealthy, and wise. And so the lesson for us here is the same as the seven churches. We need to pay attention to the great prostitute. We need to pay attention to the false prophet and the beast, but we need to be aware particularly of this way of getting after us. She is found in every day and age. We need to recognize that our hearts are all too easily enticed to worship things that are false. And, the, and to worship things that are in our culture. 
You know, I think of Augustine, the great 4th century theologian, when he was recalling his early life. His mother was a great Christian, and she prayed incessantly for him, and he started to feel a little bit of this pull to go back to his faith. And so he pray, He says, I remember praying this prayer. Lord, give me constancy and give me chastity, but not yet. And I think that that is in some ways the temptation of the prostitute for the Christian. Lord, I know that what you have for me is right. I know that sacrifice is right. I know that seeking your glory is right. I know all the things that are right, but man, I live and do I ever want to fulfill this passion right now. Lord, give me constancy, give me chastity, but right now I'd really love to just burn this sin. And that's when the prostitute gets us. And every time the prostitute gets us, just pulls us a little bit further and further down. So we have, that was, by the way, just the introduction. So here's what we have to be aware of, verses one to six. We have to understand that looks can be deceiving. That looks can be deceiving. And there's a, I think there's a deliberateness in this text and in a future chapter that we have to understand so that we can see this woman in the proper sense. So in verse 1, we read that one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. Now again, we've mentioned that the dragon, his minions, the dragon, the false prophet, and this prostitute are a counterfeit trinity and their desire is to counterfeit the work of God and to lead people astray, there is an important contrast within the work of the prostitute that we need to understand. Look at chapter 21, verse 9, just really quickly. We're not going to get into it because here we have almost the exact same wording as it describes another woman. It says this, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, are we ringing any bells? Hopefully your short-term memory isn't as bad as mine. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So immediately in this passage, we have to see a separation between two women. There's the great prostitute and there's the bride of Christ. They are as fundamentally different as anything could be. And so you are immediately confronted with the reality you're either hers or you're hers. You're either part of the prostitute's entourage or you are part of the bride of Christ and enjoy the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's it. That's your contrast immediately laid out for you. Notice that this, that this uh, prostitute is dressed to seduce. Verse 4, the description of her She's arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. This is taken straight from the first century, straight from the temple prostitutes. So the first century readers of this book would have understood, ah, she's a temple prostitute. Her gross idolatry is symboled by the fact that she was holding, again, verse 4, a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And this is the drink which intoxicates the kings of the world. And so again, we're, we're left to be thinking that, listen, it's the sexually immoral, it's the abominations, it's the opulence that, that draws people to her and keeps them coming back for more. Now again, this is not just a comparison between two women, a prostitute and a bride. This is something that has deep roots in the Old Testament. We know, uh, first of all, and we don't even need to get into detail of this because I think we all understand this, the concept of God's people being his bride and, and, a, and a constant criticism that they keep pouring themselves out to the nations is in the background of what's going on here. God has accused his people over and over in the Old Testament. Why do you keep prostituting yourself to the nations? You are my bride. You are my chosen one. And, un and unfortunately for one of God's prophets, he had to play this out literally in the land of Israel to get the message across. Israel's prophets have also shared with us that there are a number, uh, a number of references to pagan empires and nations in which they are said 
to be drunk on wealth and false religion and self-reliance and power. And so when John speaks of the great prostitutes who seduces the kings of the earth, he has in mind all of these Old Testament images. It's true of the city of Rome. It's true of the ancient city of Babylon. It's true of any city that is going to follow the directives of this woman. We've already identified a few churches. If you go back and read chapters 2 and 3, there are already a number of these churches who have fallen to the wares of this great prostitute, Laodicea being the most obvious. They've placed great confidence in wealth and success. You remember in that passage, they're criticized for not following God, for thinking that they have everything. And what, what are they? They're poor, they're dead, they're naked. They have nothing from God's perspective. And so the warning comes to us in our age. Wealth, celebrity, luxury, it all seduces Christians away from Christ. It all tempts us into the arms of the prostitute and who after the seduction that she has is going to use us and throw us away. That's what prostitution is. I mean, again, it's an image that maybe we don't like, but that's the point, right? When you go and visit a prostitute, you pay the money, you get the service, and you leave. And that's it. It's over. It's done. There's nothing lasting there. There's nothing firm there. There's nothing that's going to that's gonna generate any sort of emotional response or relational response. It's over. And that's the image you're supposed to get. When God is your father, Christ is waiting to marry you as his bride, and you are going to prostitute yourself with the culture? You're going to say, oh, this engagement ring on my finger, I'll just leave that here and go and whore myself out to my culture. That's the image you're supposed to get. And you're supposed to feel dirty when you see it. You're supposed to feel yucky and uncomfortable. Let me say it this way. Would you ever do that to your spouse? Those of you who are married, would you ever leave your ring on the nightstand and go and find a prostitute? I hope not. I pray not. You're going to get a visit from somebody if you do. And we're going to start with some physical altercations, and then we're going to get to church discipline. None of us would even dream of doing that. And yet, John lays this out and says, how willing are the people of the earth to do it every single day? So you've got to recognize that it's not, it's not the, the, what you see on the outside, it's what's on the inside. Look at verses 6, the second half of 6 and 4 to 14. John marvels at what he sees. Now, again, I'm not sure what to do with this because I don't, because I think John understands what he's seeing is really, really bad. He's seeing it in the satanic context in which which he should. But I think there's also a sense of John where he's just like, I get it. I understand why people would be influenced by this woman. I understand why they would be influenced by, I mean, look at her. She's beautiful. She's attractive. What she's selling, everybody wants. But then the angel says, why do you marvel? Why do you marvel? Let's, in other words, he resets things. He says, listen, remember back in, in verse 1? He's gonna, I'm going to show you what's going to happen to this woman. And now John's reminded, uh, let's, let me just remind you that as good as she may look now, the end that she is going to receive is going to be significant, and you need to pay attention to that. And there's some pretty strange stuff in these verses, some pretty interesting symbols, some pretty interesting things, horns and heads and stuff that we've seen in the past. And, and I, again, we don't want to get too close to the painting. If you remember the image we've used, right? We don't want to press our noses too close up against it. Uh, we want to kind of keep our distance so we can see what's going on. And when we do that, I think we'll be able to understand what's happening in these verses. So, verse 8. The beast is described as one who was, is not, and is to come. Now again, described uh, the kings in verse 10 are described in the same way. Now clearly, I think this is meant as a parody of the formula who was, and who is, and who is to come, which has been applied to God. 
a number of times. We saw it in chapter 1, chapter 4, chapter 11, and then just recently in chapter 16. And so again, here we have a comparison of what you get with God and what you get with the prostitute and what you get with following the beast. And so despite the beast's continuing power, his doom is already written. His reign is already overthrown. And his existence will end not in triumph, but in God's triumph, in his defeat. And his end is coming, and we're told already that it will be in the abyss. Again, verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And so again, if the prostitute is riding the beast, and the beast is headed for destruction, where do you think the rider goes to? Right, if a horse runs off a cliff, and the rider is strapped to the horse and can't get off, where does the rider go? That's the image. The beast is always trying to mimic Christ. Christ is the one who was and is and who is to come. The beast is one who was, is not, and is to come. He's always lesser, but he's always trying to mimic. See, sin is always a parasite on good. It's always a negative parody of the work of God. Sin, I'll spare you the theology, but sin has no independent existence It is always parasitical on that which is good. So let's use the obvious one within this passage. Sex is good. Adultery is bad. How do you know that adultery is bad? Because of God's guidelines for sex. See, sin always wants to try and make God's gift lesser. God is 777. The beast is 666. The... the, 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 the Trinity is this beautiful, pure, redemptive unity. And what is the beast? What is the false prophet and the prostitute? They are headed to destruction. They're this, this group that fights against each other, that destroys each other and everybody along with them. And so our understanding needs to be right away that every time we settle for what the beast offers... Every time we go the way of the prostitute, we settle for less than what we were created to be. And for Christians, we settle for even less because we are going to be given more than what we're created to receive. And so you are giving up the inheritance that is yours in Jesus Christ to make a bed with a prostitute. The beast is said to have seven heads and ten horns in verses 7 and 9. And they're described in verse 10 as seven kings. So uh, we've got a, sort of this multiplicity of ways in which we should understand things. Again, let's remember the number seven is expressive of, of fullness, of completeness. Uh, and just as the figures of the dragon with seven heads and ten horns in chapter 10, or the beast with ten horns in chapter 13 are, So we've seen this combination before. And again, I think our understanding, since we've seen this combination of heads and horns before, is we need to see this as transcending time and history. So we see this this woman, she's sitting on a beast, then she's sitting on seven hills, and as a result of that, we need to see her as transcending just one particular city. And I don't think that we should identify these seven kings with specific empires or specific kings, individuals, as has been tried by some in the past. But again, they're symbolic. They're supposed to communicate to us that that these kings are going to be there all the time. But they are only temporarily going to be there because they're going to be there for an hour. They're going to be there... Uh, verse 8, now is not, right? So once was, now is not. So this emphasis on on the fact that these kings look intimidating, they look like they're complete and perfect, but yet their time is already up. And so I think what John's point is by sharing sharing with us the the identity of this beast is to inform us how far we stand from the fullness of what God is doing in redemptive history. 
right? So, so he's communicating to the first generation and to us that we are, may not be, probably are not, the end times generation. And if we are, fantastic, we'll find that out on the way up. But until we know that for sure, we've got some standing to do. We've got some conquering to do. We've got some overcoming to do. And so he wants to remind God's people it's not yet over. But he also wants to tell us that it will end sometime. That, jo- that one day Jesus will come back and he is going to continue and, or he's going to bring his judgment against the prostitute and is going to then continue to save his people by glorifying them ultimately. And so we've got these ten kings, these seven horns that look all intimidating, but I want to emphasize a couple of verses here that are very important for us. First of all, look at verse 16. As the judgment falls on this prostitute. The ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute, They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. Isn't that strange? That the beast is going to turn on the rider? That what's going to happen is she will receive a gruesome fate and when the end finally comes, the way God's judgment is going to work for the prostitute is that he will just simply allow the beast to devour his rider. He will allow the beast to go after her and those who committed spiritual adultery with her are going to turn on her. They're going to turn against her. They're going to realize the emptiness of what she has given them and they're going to strip her naked and they're going to burn her and destroy her. Now don't think here that we're talking about people becoming redeemed and now returning in in vengeance against her. No, these are this is just sin destroying sin. See, the other thing that Augustine said, which is, I think, as true as you can find in Scripture regarding sin and judgment, is that the punishment for sin is more sin. The punishment for sin is more sin. And the thing is, sin is is always destructive, even of itself. You see, sin is not rational. Sin is not this perfect worldview. Sin is not this this wonderfully contained, singular sort of entity. No, sin is a mess. It attacks itself, right? We all know that, right? I don't know if you you know if if you have ever told a lie before, but if you're gonna get in, you know, if you're gonna get into the lying business, what do you got to do? Is it is, is one enough? Never, right? You got to tell another one. And then another one, and then another one, and then before you know it, you don't even know what the truth is, because you got all these lies. And then what's the what's the inevitable inevitable result of lying? How do you treat a liar? Do you trust them? No, it's a breakdown of relationship. And then when you got a breakdown of relationship, all sort of other things happen. See, the punishment for sin is more sin. And this and the prostitute realizes this in an ultimate sort of way. The punishment for her seduction. The punishment for her sin is to be destroyed by the very sin that she sells. By the very people who are convinced by her witness. And so God brings judgment upon her. But I want you to notice verse 17. Never forget these verses in Revelation. In fact, it would be a good idea at some point to read Revelation just simply looking for these kinds of verses. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handling over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. You see, God is always in control. So let's draw a few conclusions. Four or five of them. First one, we've mentioned before. We just quote one commentator because he says it just beautifully and succinctly. He says, false worship is as tawdry and cheap as prostitution. See, the image that you're supposed to get is one that makes you feel a little, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, eklik. If you don't know low German, find somebody who does. 
It's supposed to make your skin crawl. It's supposed to make you look at your spouse and say, I would never, ever do this to you. And then you're supposed to look at your Lord and say, I will never, ever do that to you. Because false worship, a giving of yourself to wealth and fame and power and sex and whatever the world is trying to sell, is the, is the physical, is, is the spiritual equivalent of physical adultery with a prostitute. And you need to see it that way. You need to feel it that way. You need to be disgusted by it that way so that you are driven to an ever more willing commitment to Christ. He has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he wants the same from us. He wants the same commitment from us. And so you're supposed to feel this image as much as you're supposed to see it. Second thing, as we've already mentioned, the powers of evil are inherently self-destructive. There's a restlessness to the beast in his cohorts. There is no rest in sin. There's no rest in evil. There's no peace that sin can bring to you. Sin always brings an angst. It always unsettles you. It always turns you. It always makes you, it's a bad way of saying it, feel bad. It always makes you jumpy and looking for, for things that are going to satisfy you more. It makes you jealous. It makes you more covetous. It makes you more lustful. It doesn't satisfy those things, but it makes you more of those things. And so there's no resolution to the problem of sin within sin. The problem of sin creates a deeper problem. You dig yourself a deeper hole every time you sin, thinking that you're getting out by digging deeper. And so alliances of evil last only for a brief time because they are turning against each other. Again, Verse 17, number three, God's sovereignty is complete. The irony of Babylon's fall magnifies the incomparable power and wisdom of God. The beast and its allies, they rage in hostility toward the lamb and his bride, and they try and use all sorts of weapons to bring down God and to bring down God's people, and at every turn, God is already ahead of them. And they will find out one day that they've been serving God. That the beast is actually in in service of the lamb. And if there's one thing in all the world that the rebels do not want, it's to serve the purpose of God. See, it's kind of like the greatest movie ever made. You know, the beast is working against God, working against Christ, rebelling at every turn, thinking that they're winning, and then only to find out that at the end, they've just been serving God all along. That they've just been doing everything that God's ever wanted them to do. That they've been fulfilling his redemptive purpose. They're helpless to do anything but serve God's purpose. They're helpless to win when God says you will not win. And so there's the encouragement to God's people that if you side with God, if you hate the harlot, if you despise what she stands for, and you stand with God, you will always be on the winning side. And that no matter what you see around you, it serves God. No matter the depravity that you see around you, it serves the purposes of sanctifying God's people. Fourth thing. Anything that is, not on, is, that is not of Christ is already being destroyed and will ultimately be so. See, it's not about the ultimate destruction of the prostitute. It's about understanding that her destruction exists every single moment. Sin destroys sin, right? The punishment for sin is more sin, but it brings destruction. You don't build by sinning. You don't have a better relationship by sinning. Right? It, it just it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, think of any relationship. We've been talking about husband and wife. Think about father-son. Think about best friend, whatever it is. Now think about sinning against that person at every turn and then ask yourself how long that they'll be friends with you. If you lie to that person, just take one lie. You don't even have to take a whole bunch of sins. But just take one sin and just say, okay, from now on, for the rest of today, I'm going to lie to my spouse. How's that going to work out for you? 
How's it going to work out for you? See, sin destroys and is being destroyed right now. And it's only as we continue to turn to Christ can we have protection against sin and that we can allow God to build what is good, right, and true within us, within our marriages, within our churches, within our own spiritual life. So then the last thing, the fifth thing that we have to ask ourselves is this. Let me put it in creepy terms. Who are you sleeping with? I just saw a few people drop their heads. Are you preparing yourself for the marriage supper of the Lamb for that day when you will be married to to Christ for all of eternity? Or are you running off behind your pledged back to prostitute yourself out to, to a woman who will destroy you? That's the question. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we recognize how easy it is in the society in which we live, to be seduced by the things that this great prostitute stands for. The opulence, the wealth, the fame, the sex, the money, the name, the reputation that we can glean. And yet, Lord, we understand from this passage, and we'll see it even more next week, how terrible it is to follow her. Lord, make us love you more. Make us find our satisfaction in you. Make us desire the purity that comes with being your child, the purity that comes with the preparation for the day when we will one day sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, when the world entices us, give us us the wisdom to be able to, to push back Lord, maybe there's practical things that we need to do. Delete an app, not watch as much TV, uh, unfollow whoever. Maybe there's those things, but Lord, in those things, again, we still have sinfulness in our hearts. That, that The victory isn't won by deleting the app. The victory is won by you on the cross as you pour out that victory through the Holy Spirit into our lives. And so we pray that you would do so within us. Change us, mold us, and shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. And Lord, may that be visible to others and may that lead to a witness to others and may that lead to a building of your kingdom for your glory and for your namesake. Amen.